We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. Hi, good morning from Brazil. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello, go Hello from, <laughs> from Poland here, Natalia. <laughs> so we are both co-moderating, me and Andre, yeah, in this session. So I will pass the, the, the start to Andre. So Andre, please. Okay, thank you, Natalia. Uh, hi, everyone. Is everyone hearing me well? Okay, just hi. give me a sign. Okay, is everything okay? So hi, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone who's attending to uh, this session, uh, Network the Trust Encryption Choices to a Reliable Internet. And welcome for those who are in person at Katowice and of course for those who are um, watching us remotely. Uh, my name is André Ramiro. I am Director of the Law and Technology Research Institute of Recife, the IPREC and I will have the honor to be your online moderator today. And to help me with this mission, uh, we will also count on uh, Natalia Sautchuk, who is a German Chancellor Fellow at the Center for Global Cooperation Research at the University of Duisburg, Essen in Germany, and who will be our on-site moderator straight from Katowice in Poland. And uh, as the rapporteur of the session, we will count on Luisa Brandão, uh, who is the executive, executive, executive director of the Research Institute for Internet and Society, also from Brazil. And before passing the word to Natalia, uh, for her to introduce finally our speakers and to open our first round of, of interventions, just a few words about our panel. Uh, it was a proposal conducted by several entities, among them the IPREC that I just mentioned, the Research Institute for Internet and Society, also from Brazil, the Internet Society, the Brazilian chapter of the Internet Society, the Center for Democracy and Technology, the ECHO Association of the Internet Industry, the Software Freedom Law Center from India, and the Prostasia Foundation. And very briefly too, uh, we consider that encryption policies or uh, more broadly speaking, encryption choices can be seen as a trust model that has to be deployed collectively towards a collective sense of trust in the digital ecosystem. So we believe that it can be seen as a possible approach uh, that might help uh, stakeholders to collaborate with themselves when it comes to uh, a collective sense of trust regarding cybersecurity with our special focus, of course, on encryption. And we count, of course, uh, on our speakers to develop further uh, those issues. And finally, um, I just want to encourage the public to participate with us by addressing your comments, your questions, your impressions on the session in the Zoom platform and your impressions too in the YouTube transmission of our workshop, okay? So uh, we will be gathering keywords uh, from the speaker's notes uh, as well as from the public questions to give form to a cloud of words and expressions that will be, of course, shared with everyone later. So that's it from me. Uh, uh, for now, and I pass the word to Natalia. Natalia, please be welcome again. Thank you, Andre. So now we start. I will start presenting our uh, participants, our panelists. First, of course, thank you all of them to accept to be here and online, of course, also. So uh, we have Patrick Breyer. 
member of the European Parliament for the Pirate Party that will be here and will be the first to, to answer our questions in the, the following round. Uh, Pablo Bello, Director of Public Policy of WhatsApp for Latin America. Uh, Lydia Stepinska Ustasiak. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little difficult, but okay. Member of the Internet Governance Forum 2021 Program Committee. Uh, Jeremy Malcolm, Executive Director of the Prostasia Foundation. Uh, Susan Loudon, Cybersecurity Expert and Professor at the Tuftos University. Vittorio Bertola, uh, Head of Policy and Innovation at the Open Exchange. Mallory Noddle, Chief Technology Officer at the Center for Democracy and the Technology. Prasanti Sugatan, uh, Legal Director of the Software, Software Freedom Law Center in India. So now to start our session here, we have two rounds. Basically, it's our discussion will be based in these two rounds. Each one of our amazing panelists will have four minutes to address this discussion, these specific uh, questions that we pass in advance to them to think a little bit about that and putting their perspective, their stakeholder group perspective, and uh, think a little bit uh, how we address this important issue that is encryption. So the first question that I want to put here, and I will call Patrick for being the first one to address this, it's about ensuring a safe digital uh, space. So how should government, internet business, and other stakeholders uh, protect the citizens including vulnerable citizens, especially that we know that there is a lot of questions in this regard, against uh, online exploitation and uh, abuse. So please, uh, Patrick, go ahead with your thoughts about this question. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm a member of the European Parliament since 2019 and a member of the Civil Liberties Committee. And um, in Europe, the, the um, encryption wars are uh, full on. Um, the European Parliament, which I'm a member of, is fighting for mandatory encryption in uh, the proposed e-privacy regulation. And uh, that was a consequence of the Snowden revelations that made us uh, fight for this, because we know today that everything that's not encrypted is not safe from intelligence services. And uh, since you mentioned exploitation uh, uh, of, of, of persons, uh, we know from, from Edward Snowden that um, NSA likes to um, share uh, pictures of, of naked persons or even of genitals just for fun. So um, I think that goes to show very much that these um, intimate um, pictures and recordings that are shared by people belong in nobody else's hands other than those concerned. European Parliament is also uh, now fighting to um, um, outlaw member states interferences with the right to encryption in the new Digital Services Act. Um, part of, of the Parliament's position will be to, to call for a provision that will guarantee users uh, and services the right to, to offer um, encryption. Uh, also on the positive side, uh, we've seen um, from Europe um, a, a government coalition agreement last uh, week in Germany uh, or two weeks, two weeks ago from Germany, um, which defends the right to, um, to encryption, which is, uh, of course, an important uh, player when it comes to policy. On the other hand, both the European Commission, so sort of EU's government, and the, the, the uh, member states, the, the member state governments, um, are attacking encryption. They are calling on providers to find technical solutions to allow them to access um, uh, 
communications content stored data, which basically means, um, you know, rendering encryption ineffective. And most of all, the European Commission beginning of, of next year wants to present um, legislation which I call chat control. So it's, a, it's legislation that would mandate um, communication service providers to um, screen all private messages for possible child pornographic content, uh, fully knowing that um, these filters are up to 86% inaccurate, according to the Swiss Federal Police, a vast majority of these flags are not even criminally relevant. And um, um, knowing that only by chance will ever sexual abuse be um, detected in this way. This is mostly about the circulation of, um, of old um, material. And also knowing that the European Court of Justice last year held that um, analyzing the content of everybody's communication, so basically mass surveillance, is disproportionate except in emergency cases when it can, when national security is threatened. Despite all that, they um, want to go ahead with this, and they even want it to be applied the screening and uh, screening obligation to be applied uh, applied to encrypted services. So, in order for for WhatsApp and Signal etc. to be able to to scan and screen private messages. Uh, they would at least have to build in a backdoor, which is called uh, client-side scanning, which has been debated at length when it came to Apple's uh, spy phone plans. And therefore, you are probably all aware of the risks this would entail. Uh, specifically, it would open up the window to use this function um, also for other purposes and even for interception purposes. And that's why the five eyes have spoken out in favor of the EU's chat control plans. And I hope that um, there will be a lot more noise about this. Our plans are going to be announced um, on the 8th of March of, of um, next year. And until then, we have a chance to, to defend our right to, to encryption and to privacy. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I have a lot of things that I could ask now, but uh, let's go just straight to Pablo. Pablo, please go ahead with your thoughts about you in your your stakeholder in in this field. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. First uh, place, uh, I'm very happy to be with you guys, folks. Um, okay. Um, as, as Patrick said, uh, encryption is under threat. No? It's uh, under threat in Europe, it's under threat in Brazil, in Latin America, and in different parts of the, of the world. So this discussion is absolutely relevant and central for the evolution of the internet from my point of view. The, 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 the question is how to defend encryption successfully. I think in some way, this is our, one of our main challenge. And to, to, to go to this uh, debate, I think makes sense to go back to the basic. So this is something that everyone here knows better than me for sure, because I am economist and not an expert on technology. But I think there is a very important point that we need to stress even louder and to say even louder that we, uh, the internet community should reject the false trade-off between safety and privacy. I think this point is critical in, in terms of the, how we are able to build a stronger narrative to explain the risks that are behind uh, the weakening of, of encryption. We don't believe there is a trade-off between uh, privacy and security. If we lose privacy by weakening encryption at the same time, in the name of security, at the same time, we are losing both. No? We are losing safety, we are losing privacy. And of course, there is no such, such thing as a backdoor just for good guys. This is something that don't exist. If there is a backdoor, criminals, hackers, financial fraudsters, hostile governments will find ways, ways to exploit it. So as, as many people have said, uh, weakening encryption would uh, will put people at risk. Uh, this is something that at least uh, I, I will repeat that uh, many people have said many times. 
but I really believe that we need to continue saying that in a bolder uh, way, because this false narrative that is used for many governments worldwide is goes to the very basic appeal to the very basic uh, questions that society has. So it's it's important to take care on the problems that under that are underneath of the issue of the going dark uh, narrative. So this idea that uh, encryption is needed and there is no trade off is important, but it's not enough from my point of view in order to uh, win this, this battle. I really believe that it's important also to have better responses to the challenge of the going dark. Uh, this discussion is there and society has concerns. Uh, so one thing is to reject this false dilemma between encryption and security, but other thing will be don't, don't take uh, steps in the right direction in order to uh, mitigate uh, the risk that we know exists, exists on, the, on the internet. Uh, societies have bad people doing bad things. Uh, this is something that is, we know that. Child exploitation is not acceptable. Terrorism is not acceptable. Organized crime is not acceptable. Serious misinformation with the capacity to affect our democratic institutions or put people's health at risk is not acceptable. So I think it's at the same time that we are very clear that backdoors are not the answer, that client side scanning is not the answer, that doing that put lives in danger, I think we as a internet community, we should do even more in order to tackle that the risks that we know that are there. Uh, the, from WhatsApp perspective, uh, we strongly believe that the combination of integrity measures to identify abnormal behaviors, for example, automatization or bulk messaging, uh, the appropriate use, and it's important to use the concept of appropriate use of limited metadata for law enforcement following legally valid orders, the use of, of cross-platform signal analysis, the design of the product to offer a strong privacy uh, feature settings uh, for users while limiting uh, viralization through friction and other, other measures, and to offer users a channel to report dangerous content like child exploitation imaginary are the base to combat misuse on our platform. And we believe that it, these efforts are needed to successfully defend encryption. And we need to do more on that side. Uh, finally, I think it's not brave. Uh, it's easy, but it's not brave just to say, we won't cooperate with law enforcement in democratic states. Uh, it's not brave to avoid responsibility uh, in order to tackle the issues that we know exist. We need to do the, our main effort in order to keep internet as a safe or at least as safer as possible place uh, because our society depends on that. So just to summary, I strongly believe that it's very important to strengthen our narrative, to be very clear that there is no trade-off between privacy and safety, and at the same time, do more uh, from the technical point of view, from the product design, uh, from our integrity efforts to combat the misuse of the blog, the, of, of the, of the, in, in, in internet, in, in our platforms. And this is something that is feasible. Uh, it's false that is not feasible. Uh, so I think uh, one of our challenges, our big challenges uh, for the future uh, are laid on that, uh, on, on, on find that uh, approach, the right approach on that. Natalia, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pablo. Very nice your 
your points. And now we come back here to on site. I will invite Lydia to put your thoughts on, on that. Thank you. Uh, as I observe fascinating European encryption debate from the position of sociologists uh, interested how technologies impact uh, societies and, and individuals, uh, I observe that uh, European debate uh, continues to, to evolve, uh, but uh, there is still knowledge gap between policymakers and uh, public around encryption. And, and of course, the legal and technical aspects are very important uh, and standardization in area uh, of encryption is, is uh, important, but also very challenging. But uh, I think that uh, what is strategically important is transparency because uh, users uh, should make conscious decisions uh, and choices on uh, their safety and uh, they should be informed on enforced encryption methodology and uh, well the question uh, which appears is, uh, can the EU really create uh, such a balance uh, between security and, and privacy? Uh, and probably uh, the answer is legally no, uh, because even if uh, the EU le legislation were to be passed, uh, data access policies and, and uh, capabilities differ among member states. Uh, so the problem with en encryption, uh, for example, in criminal investigations uh, vary from one member state uh, to another. So uh, still the, the discussion and, and further chapters uh, are still ahead from us. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. And now we, we, I invite you, Jeremy to, to comment and put also some thoughts on this question that we are discussing. Jeremy, I'm not hearing you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> I'd like to talk specifically about child safety, since that's the topic that drives a lot of the discourse around encryption and law enforcement. And at the outset, I want to affirm that child sexual abuse, including the exchange of images of abuse or CSAM, is an intolerable and heinous crime. However, surveillance and censorship are firefighting approaches that have utterly failed to address this crime. Weakening end-to-end -end encryption in popular communications apps would simply be papering over that failure. It would create a false sense of accomplishment that a significant blow has been dealt against offenders, while in reality, it would do nothing but divert those who would offend into using safer communications channels. So if weakening encryption isn't a way to ensure online safety for children, what is? The answer is simple, but politicians don't want to hear it. We need to stop fighting fires and get ahead of the problem of child sexual abuse by investing more in abuse prevention. This means treating child sexual abuse not primarily as a criminal justice problem, but as a public health problem. The difference is that when it's viewed as a criminal justice problem, we wait for a child to be harmed before we take any action. When it's viewed as a preventable public health problem, we intervene to prevent children from being abused in the first place by taking steps to reduce the risk factors that can lead to abuse and to increase the protective factors that can prevent abuse from happening. So why don't politicians want to buy into this approach? Because it's not popular among the public. That's the only reason. In fact, prevention work is highly stigmatized because people falsely believe that it's a more lenient approach. Some of you may have heard about a prevention researcher, Dr. Alan Walker, who lost their job last month because of public outrage over a podcast interview that they did with my organization, Prostasia Foundation, about their work on child sexual abuse prevention among people who are sexually attracted to children. In response to that, Dr. Elizabeth Letourneau from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post last week 
in which she said, if we really want to prevent child sexual abuse, we need to begin by supporting researchers who engage in this difficult but important work. We should also encourage those most at risk of harming a child to come forward. Assisting people who have an unwanted attraction to children helps them, it helps kids, it helps everyone. Now, this discussion is being ignored by politicians because it's controversial and they would rather just double down on censorship, surveillance and mass incarceration, which the public believes are the only solutions. That's false. And members of the Internet Governance Forum need to help to get that message out there if we want to help promote more long term solutions to this problem. At a RightsCon workshop that my organisation held this year, the participants reached a consensus around the following message, which I'd like to share with this group also. We encourage policymakers to adopt a comprehensive approach to combating CSA that is guided by public health principles and human rights standards. End-to-end -end encryption is here to stay, and the only real choice facing policymakers is how to respond to that fact. Will they finally turn their attention to the underfunded field of abuse prevention, or will they continue to waste resources on a war against secure communications that they've already lost? Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for your comments and thoughts. And I would like to invite also people from that are participating on site on, online to make some comments in our chat. Yes, if you want, because we we do a a cloudy uh, a word of a cloud of words about the comments after a while. And now I invite uh, Susan to talk about this. Susan, are you with us? <laughs> I'm not hearing. Okay. Okay, since I'm not hearing Susan, I will pass to Vittorio that's here. So comment, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I think the others for the interesting interventions. I, I wanted to start from the initial point though. Because I mean, the, 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 there was some, there is some issue, some discussion about different policies with encryption around the world. But the problem is really that we do not have a shared understanding of what actually safety means. So I mean, people complain that uh, that there's a that the encryption uh, sort of undermines safety. At least some people say so. But the, the problem is, is generally that they they have a different definition of safety than the ones that are the, the people that defend encryption do. And in the end, encryption is just a tool. So. Uh, I mean, the, there are cases in which clearly encryption increases the safety of, of end users' data and communications, well, such as, I mean, when you encrypt your end-to-end your -end communications. I mean, we, we are an open source email company, and we, we actually spent quite some time to convince all our ISP customers to actually turn on email encryption, because even in 2021, there are email providers that don't turn on email encryption or turn it on, your, on as an option, and it, there, there's still significant flows of unencrypted email data, which is amazing. At the same time, there are cases in which encrypting the data decreases safety when it disrupts, uh, for example, parental control filters or, um, or other types of filters that users actually actually want. Uh, that for when it prevents lawful interception, when there are actual criminals that are there at play, or, or when it uh, disrupts the, the blocks and prevents your ISP from blocking access to a phishing website for, for, for unsuspecting users that are not able to distinguish phishing websites on their own. So we, we have to acknowledge that there are goods and, and bads in, in turning everything into encrypted uh, flows. And uh, also there are disagreements on who is re responsible for safety. So part of the discussions come from the fact that uh, the technology providers, I mean, especially the, the big global platforms, generally think that it's their duty to provide this kind of safety. And they think they can achieve this by encrypting all the communications, which is, I mean, it's understandable. At the same time, Many states, even in Europe, many, many countries, so even not just authoritarian states, but even democratic countries like the European ones, think that uh, ensuring safety and controlling what happens over the internet is the purview of states and not of the big tech providers. And so they want access to the communication because in their view, it's their, their duty, not just their right, but their duty to, uh, to control what's happening and to prevent bad things from happening. 
And so this is also a, a clash of views that has, uh, is not easily addressed. And maybe it would be better to address this, this kind of conflicting view before addressing the fact of when and the, when do we turn on encryption and how and with, with what safeguards, if any, for, for, for access to data in certain cases. So also there's a, there's a business discussion in this. I mean, indeed the encryption is, is now being used by the big tech platforms to build cover ch encrypted channels to uh, basically transmit user data across the internet and, and create, I mean, solidify their world gardens and, and create channels that the, not just the, the states, but even the users have no access to. So as a user, if I buy a $10 IoT stuff, I mean, Chinese IoT device and I put it in my home, then it, it can open an, an encrypted connection to a server somewhere in the cloud and I don't know what's happening. I have basically I have no control of what, which data it is collecting and transmitting about me. Uh, so, so this is also something that uh, has not been addressed yet by the, the technical community. So maybe there are no clear answers to this. It's hard because the easy answers like, I mean, let's say encrypt everything or let's never encrypt anything. They are easy answers, but they don't work. I think we have to work uh, not just to tell people that are concerns to, to go away, but we have to find middle grounds, we find solutions that I mean, definitely should not involve breaking the encryption, I mean, backdoors or this kind of uh, special access. These, these are technical solutions that are, in my opinion, too dangerous. So we should not be aiming for that. But we, we do need to, as a technical community, to have an answer to, to the law enforcement people, to the people that are concerned about certain types of content, which is highly dangerous and not just uh, season child sexual abuse material, but I mean, there are lots of content which is deemed highly dangerous to societies, in, in, even in democratic countries. And, and so, the, the, I mean, my conclusion would be that we, we need to discuss and possibly get into details uh, over uh, what we want to allow and what we don't want to allow, but try to find middle grounds between the two positions, because this debate otherwise has been going on for quite a long time without any real solution or any real advance. Thank you. Now, Mallory, please go ahead with your thoughts. Hi, um, and thanks for having me. So uh, my name is Mallory Nodal. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at the Center for Democracy and Technology, as you mentioned. Um, and I also work um, as part of CDT um, on, at the steering committee level for something called the Global Encryption Coalition, which comprises uh, mostly civil society organizations, but also small businesses and technical specialists that are um, working to um, follow the policy issues around the globe and to lift up the local efforts um, to push back against any backdooring of encryption. So my comments are um, on your question about safety. So how does end-to-end um, -end encryption or encryption more broadly contribute to safety for everyone. And I think others have also mentioned that it doesn't just for everyone, it's actually um, important to think about, you know, the most vulnerable of us as well, which is typically how um, approaches to um, security, privacy, and safety online um, should, should work from the sort of bottom up. Um, and I also want to maybe focus my comments on what could be useful within the remit of the internet governance forum, since that's where we're here today. Um, so what maybe can all stakeholders think about um, as they engage in these discussions going forward and how maybe this uh, conversation has changed over time? Because as many of us realize here, um, and for those that are new to this conversation, it has been going on for a very long time. Um, there's always this debate about, you know, what can we do about lawful access? What can we do about some of the, the questions that uh, Vittorio just brought up? Um, so, you know, I think what I'm going to end up saying, so I'll give you a sort of preview of my um, inputs, is that we really need to establish sort of security as infrastructure or some um, very clear boundary beyond which uh, we will not erode encryption further in order to achieve um, the aims of this panel, which is both safety for everyone and the most vulnerable, as well as trust in our online communications. Um, because let's just do a really quick reframe. Back doors are feature requests. They are an additional um, request that, um, or idea that has been presented to services that offer encryption and end-to-end -end encryption on top of what the um, main aim is, which is to make um, secure communications both authenticated and confidential for those participating in them. Um, those feature requests, um, 
all always, and we, I've I've worked uh, with the Global Encryption Coalition, folks from ISOC and others to evaluate the technical proposals for how to do that. They all introduce vulnerability, which is not safety measures. Um, that is in effect creating um, a lack of safety. So um, avoiding then these vulnerabilities and in intended encryption and encrypted services um, is something that we have to keep in mind. So um, this is, I think, where states often play it both ways. Um, on the one hand, they really need strong encryption themselves, but then in the erosion of this through proposals that would effectively create backdoors, that actually enhances the hackability of these services, not just for um, law enforcement that maybe have received, like gained a warrant to look into communications, but actually broadly, because once you introduce a vulnerability in one way, um, it can be potentially exploited by others who have not gone through a court system to obtain such access. Um, another risk in terms of vulnerabilities that it introduces is it gives users a false sense of security, which is very dangerous. So for our lay folks um, that was mentioned before, like the ability to have a clear threat model of the risks involved, if um, services have um, backdoor vulnerabilities introduced, um, then most of us, most of our neighbors, our family or friends are not going to be able to um, understand that threat. Um, the fact that it isn't just maybe um, lawful access, but also um, hackability that will put them at risk. And um, this will also at the same time drive sufficiently motivated uh, criminals and others away from services that have uh, been weakened um, to other places where they can um, use encryption. Because as Fertorio pointed out, it's a tool. It's not that there's one into -end encrypted service out there. There are many. And because it's, um, you know, it's a standardized protocol, potentially anybody could implement it. Some will be, will remain strong. Others, probably the biggest, most accessible um, applications out there will be requested to have these vulnerabilities introduced. Um, I think that as well, I want to just say that in order to implement these features or to weaken safety in the ways that I've described, um, states and those states that are thinking about introducing these in legislative processes have not really grappled with then the other human rights considerations. Um, human right to privacy, the right to information where encryption can often enable censorship circumvention, um, and then freedom of expression that goes along with knowing that you're in a confidential conversation and you can say what you want to who you want. Um, and then there are of course economic rights that Vittorio pointed out with the business model and then social and cultural rights. Um, those are not, I think, being sufficiently considered and balanced um, when uh, proposing these changes through legislation. I think that there should be an incredibly high bar uh, to undermine these. And yet we are already being asked to develop these features without um, the, the parliamentary discussion even really uh, making this case or trying to clear that high bar. Uh, Patrick Breyer you know, mentioned that in addition, these tools are flawed. Um, the feature requests being asked for um, aren't even promised to do what they say they'll do. Um, and that we really ought to be thinking on the other end of things. So getting to my final point, which is how can we instead um, establish a baseline or a boundary beyond which we won't go so that encryption always remains strong, end-to-end um, -end encryption remains strong, and that we can build up from there so that we have, rather than this highly subjective notion of you know, what courts should be able to do and what they shouldn't, just drawing a line and upon that building trust and doing some more social focused aspects um, that others have, have pointed to. So thanks very much. Thanks. Now we go to the last intervention in this first round, uh, not, not the least, but now I, I would like to invite Prasanti to to give your thoughts in, in this topic. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening, depending upon which part of the world you are joining from. Uh, great to have you all here and great to be part of the discussion on a very important topic 
as far as the safety of the internet is concerned, the openness of the internet is concerned. In fact, in India, currently we have a committee appointed by the highest court of the country called the, the Supreme Court of the country, looking into the issue of surveillance and the use of Pegasus software sold by the NSO group. The various human rights defenders, journalists, politicians, all of them have been affected by this military grade malware, which have been found in many of the mobile devices. The very fact that um, bad actors, unfortunately in some cases, these are the government themselves, could enter these devices and get into the, all, any personal communications that we have, anything on a mobile phone itself underlines the importance of encryption. But unfortunately, instead of a discussion on encryption, debates on encryption, we have mostly parliamentarians talking about how we can build back to encryption. The focus seems to be on a misplaced questions of national security, uh, child sexual abuse material, hate speech, etc., and the back doors to, I mean, encryption being portrayed as a problem and the back doors being portrayed as a solution for all this. That definitely is an issue. In fact, India, along with Japan and the Five Eyes Alliance countries, uh, signed up a statement where they were really asking for back doors to uh, these encrypted platforms. That definitely is a problem where if we can't even um, get an informed debate from the policy makers on this issue, which is going to affect all of us, then I would say that, I mean, um, people who are part of the civil society, part of the government, we are not doing a great job informing people about the importance of encryption. We have come a long way from when encryption was used just by the military, thanks to uh, technologies used by platforms like WhatsApp and Signal, it has become very easy for anyone to use encryption. But unfortunately, the focus now is so much on these, the technologies used by these platforms and the often used phrase of going dark. And often forgetting the fact that there is a lot of other uses of encryption. It is very important for business, it's very important for citizens to transact their day-to-day -day life. But as strange as it may sound, a parliamentary panel from India recommended banning of VPN services, saying that VPN services often create issues and uh, resulting in uh, transactions being been conducted by uh, various criminal elements over the internet, over the dark web, without the law enforcement agencies being able to track them. And the solution mooted was banning of VPN services. In this pandemic phase, if most of us could work and get on with our daily life, it was thanks to VPN and such secure communication services. The very fact that policymakers could even think of coming up with such a solution, see, I mean, shows how we need to have more debates like this, making people understand the importance of encryption. We can't afford encryption to be an esoteric term which is not understood by the public. But when we were having a panel discussion and the parliamentarian was part of it, he said the parliamentarian themselves may not be very much interested in the whole issue unless their electorate, the people who vote for them, are interested in this issue. That, I mean, that, I mean, we have a person from the Pirate Party here, and I'm sure uh, you'll understand. So unless the parliamentarians think that this is an important issue, which is going to affect their people, their electorate, and how they vote, in many cases, these are not issues that are going to be debated in parliament, debated by the policymakers. So I think that is where um, all of us need to work together. There are similar issues across the world, whether it's Brazil, whether it's India, or Europe, or Australia. Similar laws being debated in most parts of the world. In fact, we in India currently have a new uh, set of rules notified by the government, which calls for traceability of messages. That is, when you have platforms, encrypted platforms like WhatsApp and Signal, the new rules mandate that if the law enforcement agency asks these platforms 
to figure out who initiated a message. Then they should be able to find out from the metadata as to, let's say if there's a chain of message, they should be able to tell the law enforcement agency as to who originated that message. So when these platforms are asked to store more and more metadata, that definitely is going to affect the privacy and security of users. I think it's come to a stage where we need to say that, okay, right to privacy also includes the right to encryption. I think that is something that maybe more, all of us should demand from our governments. The right to encryption should also be considered to be a part of right to privacy. I'll stop here. Thank you for having me. Okay. Um, so very exciting thoughts so far. And I wanted uh, for us to give some time at the end of our session for the public to participate with us as well. And I wanted to move uh, straight forward to our second round of questions, okay? So, uh, and I believe we have excellent hooks uh, in terms of uh, technical requirements that have been uh, mentioned in uh, some remarks. So how should uh, international standards address the different requirements and preferences of governments and citizens in different countries. I mean, we have uh, some patterns for end-to-end -end encryption uh, industry, for instance, in the United States, and we have uh, the European Commission pushing for client-side scanning uh, that has been very much mentioned here already. And uh, uh, on the other hand, we have in Asia and Brazil uh, traceability provisions for the sharing of messages in end-to-end -end encryption platforms uh, in the landscape of cybersecurity and uh, at the end of the day of encryption. So uh, different standards worldwide. So how do we address those challenges in terms of, uh, let's say, a, a type of a governance, a global governance of encryption, okay? So uh, for, for this, this second uh, round of answers, I would suggest for us to begin with who spoke last, if there is no problem. So Mr. President, uh, if you are comfortable with this sequence, I would uh, pass the word to you. Mr. Sorry, I missed, sorry, I missed that part. I'm sorry, sorry. I didn't hear. Uh, sorry, uh, I missed uh, that part. Yeah. So uh, I was suggesting for us to begin who with who spoke last. So uh, repeating the the questions: How should international standards uh, uh, address different requirements and preferences of governments and citizens in different countries worldwide? Uh, as far as the standards are concerned, uh, if you look at the kind of laws that each government are coming up with, whether it's Brazil, uh, the, uh, let's say Australia or India, we have similar situations in most countries. And when it comes to standards, see, uh, the problem here is technology cannot be a solution to everything. So that is where we also need the political option. So tech, yes, the standards can help us with the technology as a concern. But when you have governments coming up with laws which are going to undermine these technologies, definitely have a problem. That's why technology cannot be an answer to everything. That is where we need to have more interactions, more discussions with the various parties, various countries, or various uh, stakeholder groups to have a more kind of a combined approach across jurisdictions, to have a more uh, discussions on the political side of it, not just on the technology and the standard side of it. Okay, Mr. President, uh, and moving on, I pass the word to Mallory again, please Mallory. Hi, thanks. Um, so I think that, um, you know, when we think about trust, um, 
I think trust is really a, some, a concept between people. Um, although we do try to approximate trust in, um, through technical standards, I think if we're doing that, we wanna be really specific. Um, when it comes to encryption, there are two main elements to that. The first is authentication. So knowing who you're talking to or, or what um, server you're talking to and then the confidentiality. So knowing that you're having a private conversation and nobody else that's not authorized to be in it um, is having it with you. Um, services from a technical perspective are implementing these standards um, to fulfill user demand for uh, privacy respecting trusted and confidential communications. Um, and then we also see at the same time though, policies that are intentionally trying to erode it like um, others have mentioned, um, they're intentionally trying to degrade the provision of, of those services. Um, I'll just borrow the language. I think it's roughly from the, the Five Eyes countries and Japan and India that wrote a statement earlier this year that included the words, um, companies should not deliberately build services that deny any access. They're referring to you know, the ability to circumvent lawful access. Um, I, again, going back to the high bar that was required to fully ban a technology, um, I think that's not yet been cleared really. I mean, companies should not deliberately, de de should not deliberately build services that users want. I think um, is really disturbing that that, that would be mentioned um, because it's already hard, right? I mean, I think that the, um, major platforms that are offering end-to-end encryption, end -end encryption, for example, are really trying. There is an effort in the Internet Engineering Task Force to standardize um, messaging layer security protocol that could be applied to text messaging as well as video conferencing and so on. Um, and it is, it's, it's been a multi-year effort because the challenges are very high, especially when you include group chats. So it's not just between two people, but it's between many people. And then on top of it, I think services really do want to improve user experience. So reducing spam, um, tackling disinformation, making sure that objectionable and horrendous content isn't on their platforms. These are all things that I think platforms are, are invested in doing. And instead, they're having to spend time fighting um, the ability to just provide the service at all. Um, I think user choice means that we need to think about ways of doing content moderation and end-to-end -end encrypted systems that center user needs and consider user choice. Um, CDT put out a, a paper earlier this year that tries to do that. It looks at the different sort of proposals um, for how to do content moderation and end-to-end -end encrypted systems, comes down on a couple that might work. One has already been mentioned before. I think uh, Pablo Bello mentioned metadata analysis, which you know we feel is promising as long as, with the very important caveat, that platforms don't go ahead and start creating more metadata than they already need to deliver a message from one place to another. Um, but there's so much that you can already do to you know look at um, coordinated behavior on platforms or other things to, to make sure that spam and other things are, are taken care of. Um, other things might, you know, be more around user reporting and how to do that in encrypted platforms such that enhances the user experience but doesn't violate the promise of confidentiality. Um, and then to your, to the main question around globalization, right, like uh, a globalized approach, I mean, I think there, it would be great if we had a prolifer proliferation of strong end-to-end -end encrypted options. Right now, they are kind of all centered in the most popular services, which is great because it reaches a variety of people. Um, but I think we, we do want choice. Um, and this then goes back to my original point around if we could establish uh, strong standards, um, strong implementations that center user choice and ensure the authentication and confidentiality towards building user trust, proliferate those, then that is essentially what we have. And that's what I would call security as infrastructure. Thanks. Thank you once again, Mallory. And I pass the word to Victorio uh, for a possible point of view of the industry on this list. Well, 
first of all, uh, I think that uh, what we see here is the usual tension between the global nature of the internet and, and national regulatory efforts. But it, it reflects a, a, a difference in, uh, in national values and cultural approaches. So again, it's not really just about encryption. It is that, for example, the, the border, the maximum extent to which law enforcement should go and the procedures to get to that, uh, in, I mean, in, in contrast with the privacy of communications, is really varying country to country based on cultural and political stories of each country. And the same for content control. So, I mean, there are countries like the US which have a very broad First Amendment that protects uh, free speech in general. There are other countries, even in Europe, even democratic countries, that positively do not want to see certain types of content over the internet because they think it's endangering their democracies. Uh, be it uh, Nazi propaganda, terrorist propaganda, whatever, and then, of course, ch child sexual abuse material. There's a longer list of the content which, uh, because of the history and culture of specific countries, is considered illegal in those countries. And when encryption helps making it available, those countries get upset, and the societies in those countries get upset. So, I, in a way, I think it's up to the, the tech industry to to find ways, I mean, to respect the sovereignty of individual countries and regions like Europe, to, to set these borders for themselves and rather than pushing, the, in a way, the American approach or, I mean, approaches by individual companies and the balances that come with them to onto the entire world. And I think this is also true for the trust issue, I mean, building on what Mallory was also saying, that uh, it's not like encryption automatically gives you more trust. It depends, as we were saying before. I mean, I'm a bit worried of the message that encrypted communications automatically give you more safety, more privacy, more security, and in general, more trust. Definitely, if I know that no one is intercepting my communications, I can trust my communication more than before. At the same time, if I'm the, I mean, the unsuspecting user that wants to, I mean, someone to check my communications to check that I'm not going to any bad website, phishing or malware or whatever, then I get less trust if all of a sudden maybe my filter disappears and I found myself on a, an inappropriate or on a dangerous website. So it's, uh, I mean, uh, I, I've seen actually elderly people, including my own family, but really scared by the fact that all of a sudden their phone started to tell them to install some kind of unknown app for no, no apparent reason. and. And there was no safeguard against that because the filters have been bypassed. So that's uh, so. So I think it. Uh, I mean, even in terms of trust, it, it's not that, that simple. And we should be very, very careful about the messages we send, even with end-to-end -end encryption. Again, end-to-end -end encryption, unfortunately, is, is sort of a marketing slogan. By the way, I mean, there, there are com messaging companies that use it very heavily to promote their products. At the same time, if I send my, my communications in a secure, private, encrypted way to a company that lives off uh, surveillance advertising and user profiling and data monetization, then in the end, I will get less privacy than before. So, so uh, this is also something that needs to be communicated to users. I mean, the, the difference between true end-to-end -end encryption, which is, I mean, when users encrypt the data and only pass it to the, to the communication apps already encrypted. and uh, up to app encrypted communication, which the app still has access to, to the data is important. And if, if the company is American and, the, and even if they have servers in Europe as a European citizen, I am subject to the US Cloud Act. So in the end, the US intelligence agencies have a way to get access to my communications, even if they are end to end encrypted inside the app, or at least to the metadata around of the, the communication. So then, so I think we're simplifying again the, the discussion too much, and we, we should not start by discussing about encryption. We, we should start about trust and uh, sovereignty and these kind of issues in general. And then from that, it will descend a policy on, on encryption. Okay, thank you, uh, Vittorio. And I would like to welcome Professor Susan Landau, who is now with us and uh, who fortunately made it to be with us. Uh, thank you, Professor. And I'll pass the word to you for you to address the both questions. Thank you. And my apologies for the technical difficulties I had getting on originally. So I want to start with how to ensure international digital safety. And when I think about that question, uh, the automatic news headline it talks about privacy versus security. And that's the headline we've seen for 40 years, ever since the development of public key crypto. Uh, but in fact, it's the wrong headline uh, because the, the right issue is that we have national security, business security, economic security, public safety, and privacy 
and encry encryption, end-to-end -end encryption provides all of those pieces as well as making it harder to do some investigations. And putting the two in opposition, um, privacy versus security is a real mistake uh, in thinking about the problem to begin with. Uh, it's one of the reasons, for example, that we saw the change in both the US and the EU back in 2000 on export controls on encryption, um, because at least the US saw it as advantageous um, for various reasons for the, for the US public to have access to encryption, knowing that it would make their job harder abroad, although not that much harder since in the case of the NSA, uh, other nations were already encrypting, uh, not just the more technically advanced nations, technologically advanced nations, but by 2000, many of the nations. Uh, what it did do was make law enforcement's job harder in the United States, and it's been harder throughout the world. But when we think about the issues of international safety, as, as I suspect you all said when I wasn't here, um, every nation has its own definition. Um, China has one, Russia has another, Iran has a third, the US and France differ and so on. Um, about the only thing that nations agree on is that CSAM, child sexual abuse material is terrible and, and uh, shouldn't be encrypted, shouldn't be protected, shouldn't be allowed to circulate and so on. We say that and yet it turns out that for certain types of CSAM, certain countries uh, of the world are in fact large purveyors of that. And so something is going wrong within those countries that enables that crime, that terrible crime to happen. Um, so if we go back to my first point about uh, encryption sits on both sides of the issue, uh, then we get to the point where each nation is really going to make its own decision. It makes it complicated for the technologists. Uh, it means that we're gonna have multiple standards, but I don't see a way around it. You're not ever going to get to the point where the US and Iran and France and uh, Russia and China are going to come to agreement on end-to-end -end encryption. As for the, the uh, issue of, of a collective sense of trust, uh, goodness, it's not encryption that's the problem. It's our protocols. Um, and it's, you know, why don't we have DNSSEC widely available? Why don't we have secure BGP? Uh, that's where our problems lie. Uh, and Mallory's absolutely right that we need um, encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, ubiquitous end-to-end -end encryption, um, authenticated end-to-end -end encryption in order to ensure uh, authentication, which is absolutely essential. Uh, there's one other comment I wanna make. I heard some talk about, uh, well, we can always use the metadata. And uh, yes, law enforcement can always use the metadata. And in fact, the tech companies are also using the metadata. Uh, as we watch what the tech companies do with the metadata, which is not just to deliver your packets more efficiently in a better way to provide the service you want, whether it's a, a video or a voice over IP, which needs real-time service versus something that can be delayed, but it's also to, uh, to figure out things about you and to, uh, to probe into your privacy in rather extreme ways. So I don't think the answer um, well, the metadata is always there and let's not worry about it is the right answer. I think in fact that we need to start worrying about the metadata more. And I'll point to a, uh, a 2018 Supreme Court decision in the United States that said seven days of location data, collection of location data has such depth, breadth and comprehensiveness that it needs a search warrant. Um, and we can think of many other kinds of metadata for which that's also true. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Susan. And you came in time to keep the, the, the level of the table extremely high. And with this, I'll pass the word again to Jeremy. Please, Jeremy, the word is yours. Thank you. So as to the question about how global encryption policy can be developed in a context where countries are making incompatible rules, I'm gonna give one example of an attempt to develop a global private sector approach to detecting child grooming in chat communications. So in November 2018, a meeting that I attended called Preventing Child Online Grooming, Working Together for Maximum Impact, was organized by the UK Home Office and tech companies to launch the development of an AI tool that industry could share to detect uh, text-based child grooming. 
Now, scanning text conversations for sexual meanings is notoriously inaccurate and systemically biased. Allowing such scanning to take place violates the trust of the very groups that we want to protect. And without trust in the security of communication systems, all sorts of conversations cannot happen. For example, survivors of child sexual abuse often talk about that abuse online and may even reenact it with consenting adult partners. Allowing the, um, uh, there's no way for such conversations to be held safely when they cannot be kept private. When survivors don't feel safe to talk about what happened to them, they don't come forward at all. Now in July this year, almost three years after that AI tool had already been rolled out by major platforms, including Microsoft, Roblox and Kik, the European Parliament determined that it was illegal because it attempted to analyze the meaning of private text communications and allowing the private communications of people who are under suspicion of no crime to be scanned by experimental inaccurate AI robots and potentially flagged to police as evidence of child abuse violates European human rights law. So this attempt at a global private sector response um, to CSAM in, in child in private communications fell flat. And this is just one example of how well-meaning attempts to intervene in private conversations to make them safer actually violates human rights and reduces trust in the privacy of online communications. Anything that allows governments and maldoers to access private communications of internet users, including survivors and children themselves, is counterproductive and hurts those who we want help. Reducing the privacy of communications to catch child abusers never accomplishes the outcomes that we hope it will. So once again, returning to my point from my earlier intervention, the solution is not more censorship and surveillance, which undermine trust, but rather more stigma-free support and education, which can prevent problems from arising to begin with. When people have confidence in the security of their communications, they're more likely to reach out for help when they need it, knowing that what they have to say will be kept in confidence. So that's where I believe we should be focusing our attention rather than trying to stuff the encryption genie back into the bottle. Thank you. Thank you once again, uh, Jeremy. And I'll pass straight to Lydia. Please, Lydia, the word is yours. Thank you. Uh, as I observe uh, European uh, debate in Europe, uh, encryption uh, is perceived in two potentially conflicting ways. Uh, uh, on the one hand, it is a tool for privacy and security, and therefore, uh, in this context, it is an essential component of Europe's open societies and digital markets. But uh, the second way of thinking is, is considering uh, encryption as a tool for criminal activity and therefore an obstacle uh, to law enforcement. And uh, for example, after terror attacks in 2016, uh, a year later, the EU responded with a, with a series of uh, provisional but non-legislative uh, measures. Uh, another important context for, for this debate uh, was the rapid rise of sexual child abuse online uh, and it got uh, new importance in, during the pandemic when children had to spend a lot of time not supervised uh, at home. Uh, in a response in, in July 2020, uh, the European Commission launched two uh, very important strategies in this context, uh, one for combating uh, child uh, sexual abuse specifically, uh, and another for updating the EU security union strategy more broadly. Uh, and well, the, the updated uh, EU security union strategy we try to find a, a compromise uh, related to, to uh, security, safety, and uh, 
and uh, it declares to promote an approach uh, which both maintains the effectiveness of encryption uh, in protecting privacy and security of communications while providing an effective response to crime and uh, terrorism. But uh, when we talk about uh, standards, uh, the discussion on, on technical aspects uh, definitely should be followed by uh, joint efforts of governments and private sector uh, to build common understanding on uh, safety uh, and trust. And uh, it, it will be also imp important as a, as a part of uh, capacity building strategies on a national or European level. Thank you. Thank you once again, Lydia. And I pass the word to Pablo, who is here representing WhatsApp, uh, which is, of course, at the center of those international challenges. Please, Pablo. Thank you so much. I, I will follow in the same line that uh, the previous speaker. I, I, I really believe that in order to create this collective sense of trust and put encryption as a key factor of that, uh, there is a, a relevant challenge and, and for us. That is, that is how to include uh, the regular users in this conversation. I think these are a relevant challenge. We know, of course, that uh, for human rights activists, for journal journalists, uh, encryption, it's key, you know? it's very, very important. Uh, but not just for them, not just for people that is obviously in danger, that of course they need encryption and to be, and to have uh, tools to protect their communication, but for everyone, uh, for everyone. Uh, Encryption, of course, needs uh, helps to keep personal information secure, protects financial assets, uh, property data. Uh, in the pandemic, we saw a lot of cases of uh, health services, people uh, relying on, on, on WhatsApp, for example, to get information about their, uh, even to have uh, daily assistance with, uh, with med medical doctors. So, I think, and, and for the economic, uh, encryption right now is, a, is part of the infrastructure, the critical infrastructure of how the economy of the, of the society works. And I think this is very important to stress and to bring regular users to this uh, conversation. WhatsApp has more than 2 billion users worldwide. It's huge. It's by far the most relevant encrypted communication platform in the, in the world. Nevertheless, I will bet that not of all of, of our users are aware of the importance of, of encryption. For sure, even the less part of our users, the smallest share of our users are, are aware of that. And we are doing a lot of campaigns to explain the important explain the importance of encryption and we will continue to do that. Our head, Will Cathart, has been a vocal defender of encryption in different forums and in the media. And as you know, WhatsApp don't hesitate to def in defending encryption, even in, in courts, as we are doing in India or in, in, in Brazil. And, and we will continue fighting on, on encryption. Uh, the NSO uh, Pegasus uh, law switch in the United States in some way is part of this of, of the same approach. But I think I, I believe that this is not enough in order to change the the narrative and to win at the end this uh, this uh, this battle. Uh, uh, encryption is key uh, in almost every aspect of our digital lives. Our challenge here, in from my point of view, is still to translate better the technicalities of encryption for everyone uh, with concrete examples related with the ordinary life of, of regular people. I think our collective sense of trust is not only built collectively, but also protected collectively. Weakening encryption will undermine user safety, will endanger the life of activists, of course, but also will put risk uh, in the integrity of government services, financial services, communication, access to health uh, in the regular life. At the end, I really believe that the strongest defense for encryption should not come from us, 
the internet folks or the internet community, but from everyone, everywhere in the, in the world. This being users of encrypted services, recognizing its importance, citizens that will speak out loudly to protect their very own rights. I think this is our challenge. Uh, we need to, uh, of course, the technical debate, the, our internal debate in the ITF is absolutely relevant for the evolution of this discussion, but we need to bring our users, the, the, the whole society uh, to, to, to be part of this discussion. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pablo, very important remarks. And I'll pass the word finally to Mr. Patrick once again to give our closure to this second round of answers. Please, Mr. Patrick. Thank you, Andre. It's not uh, easy to um, add much to what uh, previous speakers have um, already said. I think when it comes to um, international standards and the, the, the basic standard should be fundamental rights because this is, uh, these are rights that apply to everyone and um, universally and uh, everybody has a right to uh, security and uh, privacy and safe communications. And um, we've seen um, court judgments in Europe that outlawed a mass surveillance or that um, outlawed data retention, meaning the indiscriminate collection of metadata on all citizens. And if that were adopted more generally um, at an international level, this would be a very good basis for this debate on encryption as well. Since we are dealing in Europe uh, mostly at, at this time uh, with um, proposals to um, establish mass surveillance and undermine encryption um, by using the hook of um, child pornography, this is uh, what um, I've been mostly looking into when it comes to uh, trust. And I have found that, <clears throat> that um, many children use uh, private communications for sexting, so for sending um, consensually um, 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 nude um, photos or, or recordings of each other. And they have a very strong uh, wish for, for, for their communications to be private. So there's an overwhelming majority, both among young people as well as adults, that um, their communication should not be, be scanned indiscriminately without any reason. And also I found that um, a victim telling me just how important these uh, private communications channels, a victim of, of child sexual abuse telling me just how important these private communication channels are for them. First of all, to, uh, to reach out and um, find help in the situation of abuse, but also afterwards to, um, to receive support, to receive counseling, to um, discuss with other uh, victims what, what, uh, what happened um, also, maybe to report to the police, and, and the victim told me they discussed with a journalist whether the story should be published, all that they really need to, 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 uh, to be private and uh, go undetected, as well as when they discuss these um, issues with their lawyers uh, and uh, def defense um, attorneys. So um, what we really need to do in this debate is to find the the emotional uh, cases and, and, and the witnesses that, that explain how, how crucial this uh, privacy and, and safe communications is to their lives, um, how, the, how the safety of, of children and adults depend on it, um, including um, democracy activists in many countries, uh, human rights defenders, etc. So we need to be just as emotional as um, the um, purported children's rights um, organizations are, and they are very emotional. We just need to find those cases. We need to find those people. And I think in the case of the, um, of the Pegasus scandal, uh, there have been so many examples of, of people whose privacy was, was invaded. And that's really the way to go to, to find those people and um, let them give a witness to, to why it is important. And I fully agree on, on what Susan Landau said that, that you know, this, um, um, 
this uh, difference and, and opposition of, of privacy and security is completely the wrong the wrong starting point. Uh, we we really need to to put that out that that both need to go hand in hand. Thank you. So thank you. We finished the the finalist intervention, and now we have one intervention here in the floor. Please, if you keep only two minutes because we don't have much time. Yeah. I try to be even faster. Uh, Alexander Isamin, professor of Free Moscow University, pirate and mathematician. Uh, I'm old enough to remember that a discussion on encryption was in the United States in previous century. Clipper chip with k depenation or export uh, and K-length uh, restrictions on PGP. Uh, seems all participants uh, in this panel are Europeans. Uh, so I just want to remind you that, say, uh, that such things already happened in the United States, and we just uh, have to uh, remember arguments which been there. Uh, also, uh, a lot of arguments about child abuse. I'm a father of two children who are just becoming teenagers, so I'm very concerned. But I'm also concerned uh, about our freedom and abuse by law enforcement agencies. By the way, on this panel, there was no law enforcement agencies representatives, and we are talking about child abuse without any statistics and any witnesses. I also remember that since the beginning of this century, when the discussion of child abuse, uh, well, called child pornography, happened uh, in Russia, and seriously, one of representative of law enforcement agencies, I think it was colonel of police, said that everyone who installs Linux is pedophile and child abuser. The same things happens now, but well, on a bit uh, other level, anyone who uses encryption is also tries uh, to hide uh, their uh, intention to abuse child. No, that's not true. But law enforcement agencies representatives are really lazy. I remember how, the, how at RIPE meeting, Europol representative came and said, uh, your RIPE database is wrong because I won't use it and Google Street View to find criminals. No, that would not happen. Uh, and answering to the second question, no, it's not a policy and not technology things. ETF is working on standards very well. But if you're raising these questions, you should bring law enforcement representative, but not just bring law enforcement representative, uh, bring him with statistics, how much abuses happened and have not been discovered because of inability to decrypt. I don't think that, uh, I think that they are not on this panel because they have no such statistics. They're killing our presumption of innocence with their laziness to work. Anyway, anytime you hear something about against direct encryption uh, from a law enforcement agency, ask them about statistics. It's not a question about technology. It's not a question about standards. It's a question about laziness of law enforcement agencies. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for the intervention. We have a very few minutes to make a little wrap up in, of this panel. We had some uh, questions also in our uh, online, uh, from our online participants. For example, we had one here, Monica Hermet, that talk about, do states still believe that nobles, nobody but us can work? or do they just pretend that it will work? And so this is one of the questions and I will not be able to read all, address all because we have only seven minutes and I want to give the chance to our panelists to make a, a final statement, like one, two, two minutes, yes, to fit in our time here. So uh, first, Patrick, do you want to try to address very quickly, briefly, the things? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, there is this question from Monica uh, about the, the, the government stuff. Um, uh, nobles, nobody but us can work or just pretend it will work or some final remarks that you have also. Okay, I'm just, I just see uh, Monica's question. Um, so 
So I can't answer the question directly, but uh, what I will generally say is that it is so valuable to have the, the panels as this and that they should uh, have a much uh, broader audience um, because um, this is a, a, a debate that concerns and affects all of us. And uh, the implications are difficult to understand for many who, who see a solution at hand. Oh, yes, great. This will help us tackle terrorists, save children, et cetera, PP. And they don't understand what, uh, how effective this is and what collateral damage it comes with. And so we really need to, to, to push stronger. And uh, I'm, I, I've been heartened by, by what happened after Apple proposed its, its uh, spy phone plans and the reaction to that. And also um, earlier this week, the, the EU Commissioner for Internal Affairs, who's pushing for these um, uh, chat control plans, uh, said at the moment, the, vo the voice of privacy is louder. And so this is some encouragement to us that we can make a difference if we speak up and defend those uh, rights. And as we know by experience, once they are gone, they are gone for good. We won't get them back. So there's only this one chance to defend these rights uh, and uh, we should use it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, the, this debate is so amazing that you want to talk very much. Yeah, but uh, okay. Now, Pablo, please, final remarks. Yeah, thank you very much. Very, very short. Uh, first, a, a, a comment. I think it's very important to consider that the threat to encryption comes from different sources in different parts of the world. In, in, in Brazil, for example, we know that misinformation and the risk of coordinated attacks uh, against democratic institutions is the main source that puts uh, encryption in jeopardy because uh, trace. So it's it's different uh, part by part, and it's relevant to have uh, to consider that in, in our in our conversation. Just for a finish, I think from my point of view, there is no trade-off between security and privacy. We need to go both. We need to get both. Uh, and encryption is uh, the tool for that. Uh, we need to confront the risk of going dark and we need to continue working in creating better responses because society at the end wants these uh, responses. These responses are not client side scanning, are not back, back doors, of course. We need to find others as we, as we discussed. And my final point, is that I, I, I really believe that we need to expand this conversation to bring uh, regular users, not just activists, not just people that objectively is in, are in danger, but also uh, regular people and to expand our narrative for including more economic reasons, more health related issues, issues uh, to, to, to win at the end, uh, the common cause uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the society, with the people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good remarks. Now, Lydia, please. Uh, I think uh, that in today's discussion, uh, there was everything what is important in the context uh, of encryption, in, in the context of uh, law, uh, societal context, and, and technical as well. Uh, everything was discussed perfectly. I would like to add one, one just one thing, uh, which is on the margin, but I think uh, that it is important. I believe that as a society, we need uh, good and responsible uh, education and there is a role for journalists who can educate uh, individuals uh, on consequences of, of uh, development of technology, uh, encryption, uh, safety, etc, etc, uh, because we need uh, such knowledge as, as individuals to ask relevant questions to governments, uh, to expect uh, uh, reliable uh, services from private sector, and uh, to, to have benefits from digitization. Thank you. So, Jeremy, your Final remarks, just quick. <laughs> You're on mute. You are muted, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. I want to refer back to Pablo's statement that there's no trade-off between security and privacy. And I have a different perspective on that, which is that um, the, the only way that we can get absolute security 
um, and have no privacy is in jail. And we don't want to live in a society like that. Um, so there has to be um, some uh, trade-off, in a sense, between security uh, and privacy if we want to live in a free society. And um, if authorities know of particular users who they have probable cause to target for surveillance, then they have investigatory powers that allow them to do that. But that doesn't translate into weakening encryption across the board. That is unnecessary, it's illegal, and it reduces trust in communication systems. Nice. Uh, Susan, please, final remarks from your point of view, comments. Sure. So I'm going to reference a report I <coughs> excuse me, participated in a couple of years ago with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace called Moving the Encryption uh, Debate Forward. <coughs> Sorry, I caught a frog in my throat. And um, this report had senior uh, ex-members of, uh, ex of government, civil society, people from industry, and some academics. Um, we threw away two straw men. Um, one, <coughs> that there's no point thinking, not thinking about ways to access communications, <coughs> sorry, and still keep them secure. And the other, that law enforcement can't do its job if it can't access communications. And we came up with a set of principles that um, there needs to be utility in any solution. It can't be, uh, any solution can't be repurposed for um, mass surveillance and so on. Um, we also went down a tree looking only in the United States about what the issues that, that seem to be most pressing. And it was not um, foreign intelligence, it was law enforcement, it was not, um, it was not end-to-end -end encryption, it was devices. Um, the solution was not um, uh, escrowing keys. The solution might be accessing the data on the phone. Uh, it was not, uh, sorry, it was not um, using um, updates to, uh, to make the phone insecure and so on. Um, there are two things that are striking about this report. The first, is, there are many things actually, and I would urge you to read it, but the two things I wanna to draw to your attention um, first, that we said, if you can't solve the unlocking the device problem, um, then you can't solve anything. And uh, you shouldn't pass laws or policy till you, till you actually have a technical solution and see if it can work at scale. The other is I would urge you to look at the authors on this report, uh, which include people who are now in well, you have the, the now director of national intelligence and the now second in, 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 in the Department of Justice were people who participated in the report. Um, so I think it's a very powerful report, both for what it says and for uh, who signed on to it. Thank you. Thank you. As our colleagues see here, we are, our time is up, but we have just a few minutes. I imagine our colleagues from the Rome we were set. A few minutes to only conclude here with uh, Vittorio, your, your thoughts. I'll, I'll be very quick. First of all, I am a bit disappointed that again and again, we have come down to discussing child sexual abuse versus law enforcement because Yes, it is a problem. It's a serious problem, but it's, as I said, just one small part of, of the problem. And we should really focus on all the aspects of the discussion, which are really about uh, sovereignty, about uh, power and control over the internet in, in a certain way. So uh, they are really about different user groups, because as a, as a hacker, as an engineer, as I am, I have no problem in securing the internet myself, and, and possibly then I don't need and I don't want anyone messing up with my communications, but maybe the average ordinary non-technical user really wants someone to check the communications for them, at least in some cases and under their own control and with their own consent. So, uh, so in the end, I think we, especially with the lawmakers, we, we should have a broader discussion and especially be sure to understand the long-term strategic implications of the switch to an entirely dark encrypted internet and of the changes in power and control that it will bring between the big tech companies and the governments. That, that's really the long-term aspect that worries me more. Go ahead, Mallory. Sure, briefly, um, I'll go back to what others have said and something I've been also myself saying for quite a while, but um, you know, governments have an opportunity. They've, there's the, there are several 
UN high level discussions right now about cybersecurity. Um, it would be really great, I think, if we could all work on establishing um, these sorts of boundaries that lift up people centered approach to cybersecurity, which um, would require, I think, a you know, commitment to not try to backdoor into encryption and to make sure that it's strong and ubiquitous. Many things could be done um, on a platform like that. And I think, um, like I said, there are plenty of opportunities um, for states to commit to doing that. I would expect the democratic governments to be first in line. And many of them do say that they appreciate strong encryption, they support it, they wouldn't wanna break it, but then um, often then come up against these issues over and over again. So I'm looking forward to having this conversation um, in another 20 years, if we have to, I'll be around, um, but it would be nice to also start moving it forward and um, getting more specific without this constant threat of the idea that the biggest, most ubiquitous user-centric services will have to offer um, poor security. Let's not do that. Thank you. Uh, we have now uh, a last intervention from Presenti. And after this, uh, our rapporteur will share some of our cloud of words to see more or less what appeared here in our discussion. So please, Presenti. Yeah. Uh, as far as the international human rights standard of right to privacy and right to free speech are concerned, these are non-negotiable and any exceptions as far as the states are concerned to these rights they should be very narrowly worded and with proper safeguards we cannot have a situation where uh, let's say the rights of citizens uh, are affected let's say, for example you, ha you can have targeted surveillance but there should not be a situation where governments do things which result in in weakening of security for everyone so, that is my um, final remark. We cannot have any mechanisms which result in weakening of security for the public in general. Targeted surveillance, yes, but mass surveillance, a big no. Now, Louisa, please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia, Andre, and all of you, our speakers. Um, as reporter, I collected uh, the impressions from our speakers and also from some commenters, uh, some comments uh, in the chat. And what we can see, of course, encryption is the main <laughs> uh, topic discussed. But one thing that is very interesting is that security and privacy, they are at the same level. You can see they are uh, discussed um, equally and uh, that um, point how how much uh, we must follow this path that they are not opposite they are um, complementary and how we must uh, involve this um, this discussion about trust communication um, and uh, it's about the uh, human rights and uh, how to protect the society against surveillance, censorship, and establish standards such as end-to-end -end, um, that appeared a lot to, to make um, our rights, our human rights uh, enforced uh, uh, around the world. So thank you very much, all of you who contributed to this uh, tiny demonstration of the discussion. And um, as Mallory pointed out, we will be around for the next years and for how many years is needed to um, build a trusted and reliable network for everyone. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Good night for everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>